Today we're going to discuss black holes, but the main topic is going to be in regards to the type of black holes that we unfortunately know very little about – intermediate mass black holes. Black holes that are different from the stellar mass black holes, usually formed as a result of a supernova, and different from supermassive black holes located in centers of various galaxies. And so these very strange cosmic middleweights have actually been more or less hypothetical up until approximately a decade ago with one of the first potential discoveries happening in 2009 in a galaxy ESO 243-49. Here based on the observations of X-rays, the only possible object that could have produced these specific emissions seemed to be some kind of a really massive, but not super massive, black hole-like compact object. And so for a very long time, except for these very few detections, intermediate mass black holes remained as a kind of a missing link in helping us understand the universe. And that's because they were just super difficult to find, and nothing with a mass of above 100 solar masses, but below 100,000 solar masses, was easily detectable out there. And specifically here the main question was in regards to their formation, because they were just too massive to be formed from a single star collapse, which is how we believe stellar mass black holes form, and usually their environments don't seem to have extreme conditions to form super high densities and velocities, similar to galactic centers, where we do expect supermassive black holes. And so we had this very important missing link. A missing link that could potentially explain how some of the more massive black holes, so here we're talking about central black holes, grow to such immense sizes. Because for a very long time the hypothesis was that intermediate mass black holes potentially served as crucial seeds or building blocks in helping a lot of central black holes become much larger, usually through the combination of galactic mergers, which leads to the merger of black holes, or possibly through the initial large collapse of the central seed, followed by the collisions from smaller seeds representing these intermediate mass black holes. But some of the recent observations from the James Webb and especially observations involving supermassive black holes, started to provide more evidence that many central black holes can easily collapse by passing the need for any intermediate mass black holes, suggesting that maybe some of these previous ideas and previous propositions were not entirely correct, and suggesting that maybe intermediate mass black holes are exceptionally rare and thus even more mysterious. And so here, by finding and studying more examples, we can maybe finally have some conclusions. But I guess the main question here is, why is it that they are so elusive? Or why are they so difficult to find? Well, the answer to that is pretty simple. We don't expect them to gobble up gas and stars as voraciously as supermassive cousins, suggesting that they are not going to emit powerful radiation detectable from faraway distances, and they are also unlikely to have any massive partners around them that would give them enough gas to produce massive accretion disks. And so it's only really in examples like this that we can sometimes catch them in the act, usually during some kind of a feeding frenzy, when some kind of a star or maybe some kind of a massive gas cloud approaches too close. And so prior to the recent discovery that we're going to be discussing today, we actually only had two definitive detections of intermediate mass black holes that were certainly there, and both involved gravitational wave signals. Here we had two events, GW190521 and GW231123, both of which we discussed in videos in the description, that resulted from merger of two black holes, eventually forming something that would qualify as an IMBH, intermediate mass black hole. Here these two detections were almost certain, but here we don't really know exactly where they are, or more importantly, we don't really know how these original two black holes that collided were produced, because here these are referred to as impossible black holes due to their initial mass. You can learn more about this mystery in one of these videos in the description. On top of this, in some cases, in some of the smaller galaxies, some low luminosity central black holes sometimes also show properties consistent with being intermediate mass. But in most cases we also have alternative explanations, so it's not entirely certain what types of black holes those are. But one of the most interesting detections when it comes to these black holes is what's known as ULX, Ultra Luminous X-ray Source. And as the name implies, these are very very powerful X-ray sources that in most cases would be very difficult to explain if this was not a black hole. Because their luminosity is much more powerful than any known stellar process, but not as powerful as a supermassive black hole. They're literally right in the middle. And though technically it's not entirely clear what powers these objects, the accreting intermediate mass black hole is essentially one of the most accepted explanations. 
And technically this is not a new object. They were originally found back in 1980s by the Einstein Observatory. One of the first such observatories, whose goal was to study the universe by observing the X-rays. And it did discover a lot of different sources we never knew existed, but it was these ultra-bright X-rays that were super mysterious. And over time, the observations from additional telescopes, such as Chandra, revealed that there seems to be at least one ULX per galaxy. Although unfortunately for the Milky Way, none have been found yet. But of all objects out there, over 20 such objects have been discovered inside globular clusters. And this is actually exciting because when it comes to intermediate mass black holes, globular clusters have always been predicted to be the main possible source. And for these types of objects, seeing a source of such extremely powerful X-rays would be very difficult to explain if it was not an intermediate mass black hole. And so here the observations in the X-rays seem to provide the most exciting evidence and so far discovered some of the most exciting such objects. Which brings us to today's story. Extremely recently NASA released this image. The image created by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope in collaboration with Chandra X-ray Observatory. Although here they also used images from the XMM Newton, the ESIS X-ray telescope, in order to get the most data. And here we have a very exciting candidate for another intermediate mass black hole. This is the object officially known as NGC 6099 HLX1, or just HLX1 for short. And that's because unlike previously discovered X-ray sources, this is a really intriguing character. Here HLX stands for Hyperluminous X-ray Source. The source that seems to exist at the outskirts of an elliptical galaxy, roughly around 450 million light years away from Earth. But more specifically, it's about 40,000 light years away from the galactic center, suggesting that this is not a supermassive black hole. And so either this is some kind of a wandering black hole, one with a lot of mass, or a typical intermediate mass black hole that suddenly consumed a lot of mass, producing an enormous accretion disk. And well, the story of this object really comes alive when you look at its activity over time. Here we have the first detection in 2009 by Chandra X-ray Telescope, where it showed an unusual X-ray source, relatively low in luminosity, compared to what happened next. Because in 2012, when XMM Newton observed it, it seemed to dramatically increase in brightness. Here, the luminosity in the X-ray frequencies was about 50 to 100 times brighter than in 2009. It essentially became what we refer to as hyperluminous X-ray source. Source whose energy was at least 100 times more than the ultraluminous X-ray source, and that was suddenly producing too much constant energy compared to what's expected from, for example, a supernova. And when comparing this to a typical solar mass black hole, so something we refer to as an X-ray binary, here the emissions were a thousand to a billion times more powerful. But that was in 2012. In 2023, this object was observed again. And surprisingly, the X-ray emissions have declined to levels that were seen in 2009. With the additional observations from the SWIFT telescope basically not seeing anything because it was below the threshold for that telescope's instruments. And so this kind of shows us something very peculiar. But for astronomers this does suggest an intermediate mass black hole activity. And researchers believe so because of few key pieces of evidence. The first one is the extreme luminosity and variability. The peak brightness here of 2 to the power of 42 ergs per second is just too bright to be any kind of a stellar mass black hole. In other words, this cannot be an X-ray binary. But the fact that the X-rays varied so much, by almost a factor of 100 times, is a strong indicator that this is some kind of a transient and potentially some kind of a black hole event. As a matter of fact, here the observations seem to match directly different propositions in regards to intermediate mass black hole feeding behavior. So something like a tidal disruption event. Then, for the second piece of evidence, we have the soft X-ray spectrum. In all three periods of observations, the X-rays coming from here were relatively soft. Or basically, the X-rays had slightly lower energy, between 100 and 3000 electron volts, and were thus not as powerful. And this differs from most of the background active galactic nuclei, which very often produce extremely powerful X-rays, and also generally produce very different emissions. Then, for our third piece of evidence, we have the optical counterpart. In addition to the X-ray data, there was a discovery of a point-like blue optical counterpart, first seen by the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope back in 2022. And it was also confirmed by the Hubble in 2023. Now, this was a very faint observation, but it was way too bright to be an individual star, 
and also not bright enough to be a supernova. And because Hubble telescope was not able to resolve it very well, it suggested something relatively small but something very bright. Once again, kind of matching the descriptions for intermediate mass black hole feeding behavior. And so given all this, what do we actually know about this object and what are the most likely conclusions? Well, right now the most compelling scenario and the one that fits all of the observed data is that HLX1, which by the way represents one of the most powerful such X-ray sources detected so far, seems to be an intermediate mass black hole within some kind of a compact star cluster, possibly even a globular cluster, in the halo of a galaxy known as NGC 6099. And the main reason it seems to have become active in the X-rays was possibly because of uh, some kind of a tidal disruption event, when one of the stars in this globular cluster approached the intermediate mass black hole and started to fall apart. Here the star's material formed the accretion disk, heating up all of the gas and emitting powerful X-rays with a temperature of about 3 million degrees Kelvin, which is consistent with the TDE for such a black hole. And because it was so variable and changing brightness so much, this also potentially tells us that in 2009 we seem to have captured some of the early phases of this disruption event where the initial X-ray emissions might have come from a lot of shocked gas in the self-interacting accretion stream. And this was before a disk fully formed. But the 2012 peak would potentially represent a fully formed accretion disk with much much higher luminosity. Whereas the more recent data from two years ago in 2023 very likely showed us the declining phase. And so right now the timing here seems to once again match some of the predictions for intermediate mass black hole feeding events. But obviously this could be something else as well. For example, one of the other bizarre explanations might involve what's known as the state transition for an intermediate mass black hole. Or basically an intermediate mass black hole that suddenly grew much much larger as a result of some kind of a collision. But switching between such masses without producing additional emissions is not really that typical for such objects and also the predicted time scale for such a transition is usually in centuries and not in decades. They also consider this to be some kind of a background object such as for example a very distant quasar far away that could just appear to be dimmer but in reality is much much stronger and much much brighter. But here this doesn't work because we have an optical counterpart and it seems to be point-like and very faint. And if this was a quasar, this just would not really make sense because we would be seeing something entirely different. But I guess the bigger question is, what do we know about this optical source and these optical emissions? Or to be more specific, are we seeing some kind of a young star cluster or just a very large irradiated disk? Well, if this was a star cluster, it must have been super young. Here there was a lot of blue color, suggesting that these stars would only be 6 to 8 million years old and also possess significant stellar mass. But in most simulations today, such unusually powerful clusters should not be producing intermediate mass black holes. And so right now the preferred explanation is that this unusual blue emission very likely came from the X-ray irradiated accretion disk, with all of this just being the result of the tidal disruption event. Right now all other explanations do not make as much sense. And so by itself this observation right now provides us with the strongest physical evidence and specifically observational evidence for the existence of these elusive objects. It also offers us some insights into how supermassive black holes seem to grow because by existing inside some kind of a cluster or inside a compact dense environment, some of these black holes might eventually coalesce with central black holes, contributing to their total mass. But I guess more importantly, it shows us that we can definitely conduct these multi-wavelength observations of various very powerful events in practically real time. Here we have enough data points and enough observations in different frequencies to directly model how black holes consume stars, explain how long these events last and what seems to happen around these black holes as the stars are consumed. But here it's the additional observations that are going to matter the most, because in most tidal disruption events we've actually observed them repeat on many occasions. And that's usually because sometimes the star is not instantly consumed by the black hole but actually comes back for the second round very often in a couple of years. And so here future observations might show us another one of these powerful emissions. And now that we have Vera Rubin Observatory in operation, we might see a lot more optical events as well, potentially revealing additional black holes we never knew existed. Technically it's capable of detecting these TDEs from hundreds of millions of light years away in real time. And so in the next five years we might be seeing more and more, potentially resolving a lot of mysteries all at once. Although at least for now it's still a bit of a mystery and we still know so little about these strange elusive black holes.
And so once we discover something else, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access and a few more things. Or maybe support the channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.